Right now is a great time to prepare a character for the DLC. So open up this guide alongside Elden Ring, and by the end of this video, you'll be whatever level you want, you'll have the most versatile talismans, you'll have the strongest character buffs, you'll have infinite smithing stones to fully upgrade new weapons, infinite glove wart to fully upgrade any new spirits, a ton of larval tears to respec your build going forward, and you'll have rune arcs, powerful consumables, and your flasks upgraded too. We'll also go over some tips for quickly defeating Radan and Moog, who are both essential kills for entering the DLC, and we'll have a quick discussion about which NPC questlines might see resolution in the Land of Shadow. So let's get into it, starting with rune farming. Most people seem to finish Elden Ring somewhere between level 100 to 150. Inside this range is also where most people PvP, so this range is what I'd recommend leveling up to to have a good experience in the DLC. It gives you enough stat points for good weapon scaling and spell access as well, and most importantly, perhaps, you'll have enough points left over for 60 vigor, which is the recommended amount for the endgame. Now, if your main character is in New Game Plus, then you should know that traditionally DLC enemies that you fight will also deal more damage and have more health if you're in New Game Plus. So you have a decision to make here. Will you enter the DLC with your New Game Plus character and get them to a higher level if necessary? Or will you make a new character and prepare them for the DLC? Whatever you decide, let's talk about rune farming. Honestly, the best way to level up is just by completing the game if you haven't already, but if you want a quick fix, then the best place to visit is still Mogwin's Palace. Here, you can lure this bird off a cliff, or kill the helpless Albanorix for a ton of runes. There are two ways to get to this rune farming area. Late in the game, you're able to get here by taking this waygate in the consecrated snowfield, but if you're still in the early game, then you're actually able to get here much faster by completing Vare's questline. First, talk to Vare at the first step, Side of Grace. Then defeat Godric at Stormvale Castle. And talk to Enya back at Round Table Hold. At this point, Vare should appear at the Rose Church here in Leonia, where he tasks you with invading as a Red Phantom. If you're playing online, then you can simply invade three players with the festering fingers he gives you. And if you're playing offline, then you can find a red summon sign here, and defeat Magnus the Beast Claw instead. For the final step, talk to Vare again at the Rose Church. He'll ask you to soak a favor in the blood of a maiden. The closest one is in Leonia, here at the Church of Inhibition, which should be approached from this direction. With this, you can return to Vare, and he'll give you an item that can teleport you to Mogwin Palace. And once you've teleported here, ride back south while hugging the eastern side of the map until you reach the Grace with a bunch of lazing Albanorix. These Albanorix give a ton of runes, especially if you have a good AoE option as part of your build. For example, if you're a cleric, you could try to use the Burn O Flame incantation that you can get from the Remembrance of the Fire Giant. Or if you're a Strength Int build, you could use the Ruins Greatsword, located here, to cleave down enemies with that instead. Radan's Greatswords will also work really well. Use whatever you can, but the best option by far is the Sacred Relic Sword from the Elden Beast's Remembrance, if you're a Faith build that's beaten the game. But since you're probably in the early game, another option exists here for rune farming, and all you need for this is a ranged weapon. To do this farm, sit at the grace, walk over to the cliff without going too far forward, and snipe the monstrous crow so that it aggros and runs off the cliff. This nets you a ton of runes without any risk, and all you need is a bow and arrow, which you can get easily here from the merchant on the beach of Limgrave. Actually, beyond this merchant, you can also pick up a gold pickled foul foot, a consumable that will temporarily boost your rune acquisition by 30% for a short time. In addition to that consumable, you can also pick up the gold scarab talisman 
to help your rune farming go even faster. This talisman increases rune acquisition by 20%, and you can get it from the abandoned cave in Kaelid, as long as you're strong enough to defeat two clean rot knights. To get there, head east from the smoldering wall site of grace, and platform across the canyon, located here. There are a bunch of other powerful talismans that will be useful for any build, so let's talk about those next. In terms of defensive talismans, it doesn't get much better than these four. Let's start with the Great Jar's arsenal. In Elden Ring, it's best to maintain at least a medium load weight, which means your weight ratio needs to be lower than 70%. To maintain this and still equip new gear, it's great to level your endurance, of course, but in addition to that, it's also great to have the Great Jars Arsenal, which is one talisman that raises your maximum equipment load by 19%. To get this, go down the elevator in the Mistwood of Limgrave, and stick to the right side of the underground all the way until you reach an elevator that will require two Stone Sword keys to activate. Activate it, go up, and run through the Northern Canyon until you arrive at the Great Jar. Here you must defeat three pretty difficult NPC summons to receive the Great Jar's arsenal. Next, most enemies do physical damage, so the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman is always great to have on hand, as this reduces physical damage taken by a massive 20%. To get this, start at the Drainage Channel, Site of Grace, in the Halig Tree, and follow this path. Next, if you want 8% extra health, the best medallion you can get is found just after you burn down the Erd Tree. At the capital of Ash, drop down into the sewer and land on this beam below. To stack with that, you'll want the Erd Tree's Favor, plus two, which is also in the Ashen capital. Start from the Forbidden Lands, side of Grace, then cross the bridge to the elevator, which will take you to this open area. Beyond some ulcerated tree spirits is your prize. So, these are great defensive talismans for any build, but another approach you can try is building compounding damage bonuses with your offensive talismans instead. For example, combining the Ritual Sword Talisman the Exaltation Talismans, the Claw and Spear Talismans, and other similar items will increase your damage dealt exponentially. I'll leave a link to some of the best ones in the description. And if you're looking for some unique build ideas for the DLC, go and check out this video, or subscribe as I might be putting out a new build video soon. Other than talismans, one of the quickest ways to make any character more powerful is making sure you have a set of temporary buffs that you know how to stack correctly. Temporary buffs fall into six different categories in Elden Ring. There's weapon buffs, shield buffs, body buffs, aura buffs, and regen buffs for both your health and stamina. Now, of these, in my opinion, the two most important ones you should focus on are body buffs and aura buffs. This is because they're very powerful and very accessible. For example, speaking of body buffs, this is Boiled Crab, which gives you a 20% physical damage negation. Alternatively, if you have a bit of faith, you should be using Flame Grant Me Strength, which gives a 20% boost to your physical and fire damage. Boiled Crab can be purchased easily if you do Bogart's quest line, which starts here in Leonia with Raya. Talk to her then go and pay Bogart for her necklace, after which Bogart will become friendly with you. You can now stock up on boiled prawn, but if you want the stronger version of this, then you'll need to find Bogart again here, in Altus Plateau, where he'll happily sell boiled crab forever, unless you progress the Dung Eaters questline. So this is a great defensive body buff but if you have 15 faith and you want offense instead, then Flame Grant Me Strength is an incantation that only requires 15 faith to cast and can be found here. The only downside of this buff is that it only lasts 30 seconds. As for aura buffs, Golden Vow is the way to go. 
This can be found as a weapon art here, and you can always have it handy if you put it on a light dagger and simply use it to buff yourself. However, if you have 25 faith, then the spell version of Golden Vow is even more powerful, giving you 15% extra damage and 10% damage negation for 80 seconds. This spell is located here, in the northwest of Altus Plateau. Honestly, investing in 25 faith is just so worth it for almost every build. You get so many utility spells, but Flame Grant Me Strength and Golden Vow alone make it worth it. With these, you'll have your body buffs and your aura buffs sorted for whenever you start any major fight. And of course, also make sure you collect the correct crystal tiers for your Flask of Wondrous Physic. Finding a combination that elevates your build specifically will give you a huge power spike. Two tiers that work honestly really well for any build are the Green Burst Crystal Tier for Stamina Regen, located here, and the Crimson Burst Crystal Tier for HP Regen, located here. These two together fill both of your regen buff slots, which is just a huge boost for any build. Next, you're going to want to try new weapons in the DLC. Therefore, you're going to want to be able to upgrade them quickly. So, instead of hunting down 12 of each smithing stone to get your weapon to plus 24, or one of each somber smithing stone to get your weapon to plus 9, you should instead go out and collect all of the miner's bell bearings. With these bell bearings, you'll be able to visit the Twin Maiden statue in Round Table Hold and quickly buy whichever smithing stones you need. First, let's go over the bell bearings you need to upgrade a weapon to plus 24. First, you'll have to get the one from the Raya Lucaria Crystal Tunnel, the one located here in the Sealed Tunnel in Altus Plateau, The one located here in the Zamor Ruins. And the one located here in Faramazula from the required boss, Godskin Duo. Next, the Somberstone Miner's Bell Bearings can be found here in the Celia Crystal Tunnel in Kaled, here in the Altus Tunnel here at the First Church of Marika, here near the Tempest-facing balcony in Faramazula, and here just before the Beside the Great Bridge Grace in Faramazula as well. While you're in Faramazula collecting all the Somberstone bell bearings, you should also consider taking care of various ancient dragons scattered throughout the city. If you want to upgrade some regular weapons to plus 25, then we can grab a few easy ones while we're here in Faramazula. One is dropped by the Ancient Dragon that attacks you just beyond the Crumbling Beast Grave Site of Grace. This is just after you first arrive in Faramazula. A second can be found after starting at the Dragon Temple Altar Site of Grace. Take the northern exit and pull out your telescope. Your prize is up on that ledge. To get there, you'll have to progress along this path, going out, through the hallway, up the stairs, then head back the way you came, jumping on this floating pillar. The smithing stone is just ahead. A third is dropped by the ancient dragon beyond the dragon temple rooftop side of grace. Defeat it. And while you're here, go behind it to grab the somber ancient dragon smithing stone sitting here as well. These somber stones can be used to upgrade your somber weapons to plus 10. For more somber ancient dragon smithing stones, consider the one here in Mogwin Palace, just beyond the Dynasty Mausoleum Midpoint side of grace, underneath the giant statue. Or another easy one can be attained if you're invaded by Anastasia here in the consecrated snowfield, southwest of Ordina, liturgical town. After this invasion, you'll receive a stone. Anyway, these are just some of the easy stones to pick up. If you want more ancient dragon smithing stones, go and check out the links in the description. 
While we're on the subject of collecting upgrades, let's talk spirit summons. All spirits can reach plus 10 as their maximum upgrade level, requiring either ghost or grave glovewort, depending on what type of spirit they are. And luckily, instead of hunting down these upgrades individually, it's way faster, again, to simply grab the bell bearings for glovewort. You can find the glovewort picker's bell bearings here in the Windham catacombs, here in the giant's mountaintop catacombs, and here in a small body of water in Faram Azula. In order to max out your chosen standard summon though, you'll need to pick up Great Grave Glovewort. There are only six available and they're found in late game locations mainly, including the giant conquering hero's grave located here in the mountaintops, or the scarlet rot pond in the Halig tree. Those are two easy ones to pick up. Next, let's get the bell bearings for spirits that require ghost glovewort. You can find the first one here, in a gazebo in Nokron, here in a chest in Noxtella, and here in a graveyard just before the Halig tree roots. If you want to get these spirits to plus 10, there's only four great ghost glove warts to be found. There's one in a chest found after fighting the Dragonkin soldier in the Ainsel River, another in the Knight's Sacred Ground under the skeleton statue, one located inside a chest in a room that's guarded by a silver sphere in Noxtella. and one at the Mogwan Dynasty Mausoleum, hidden away in the cave before the Dynasty Mausoleum Midpoint Grace, as you can see here. Once you have the means to upgrade your spirits, you need to decide on which one is good for your build. Personally, I like to choose spirits that thematically match my build, but of course you can't go wrong with the Mimic tier found in the Eternal City here, that's always going to be strong. One of the easiest ways to become more powerful is to take a tour around the lands between, collecting all of the golden seeds and sacred tears along the way. Golden seeds increase the amount of crimson and cerulean flasks you can carry, and sacred tears increase how much health or FP your flasks replenish. If you're interested in picking up the vast majority of these quickly, then you can simply hop on torrent and follow this route that I'm showing on screen. This way, it's as simple as running past these trees and picking them up. However, if you want to hunt down every last one, then you're gonna have to do some legacy dungeons. So for a full list containing every seed and tier, check out the link in the description. In the DLC, you're probably going to want to respec to test out new weapons and spells. So for that, you're going to want a lot of larval tiers which enable you to respec at Renala. If From Software are smart, then they'll make Larval Tears an unlimited resource in the DLC somehow, because unfortunately, as it stands today, Larval Tears are a limited resource. Here are the locations of some in Limgrave, in Kaled, in Altus, in Mount Gelmir, in the Consecrated Snowfield, Shifra River, and Noxtella. Once you've found a build that works for you, it's important to see how much poise you have with the armor or talismans you're wearing, which can be seen on the equipment screen here. The higher your poise, the less chance you have of being staggered by certain attacks. 
For most PvE builds, you're going to want at least 51 poise. This is a crucial breakpoint, as having less than this is actually borderline useless, as far as PvE is concerned. But having more than this will stop a ton of enemies in the game from knocking you around. There are some other good breakpoints to hit after 51, but if you really want to stack on the poise, know that there's not much point going beyond 101. To help you get over these breakpoints, consider using one or two pieces from heavier armor sets. The most poise heavy sets are the Bullgoat, Veteran, or Lionel set. The most powerful consumables in Elden Ring are rune arcs, which can be used to enable the power of whatever great rune you have equipped. Speaking of great runes, Redans or Morgoths are pretty much great for any build. Now, one way to quickly stock up on rune arcs is to visit certain nomadic merchants. Three are sold here in Leonia. Three are sold here in the mountaintops. Three are sold outside Lane Dell, and three are sold here, inside the Mogwin Dynasty Mausoleum. Beyond this, you can engage in multiplayer to farm some rune arcs. You can either invade and defeat other players in PvP, or you can help other players in PvE co-op. Pretty much everyone has their ability to put their sign down and be summoned, but if you don't have the Bloody Finger Invasion item, you can get it from Vare's questline, discussed earlier, or you can find a different Invasion Finger within the Recusant Hideout, located here in Mount Gelmir. As for other consumable items, one I might recommend taking into the DLC are these stimulating boluses. These can be eaten to remove sleep buildup, and we did see a sleep swamp in the DLC trailer, just saying. To get an infinite amount of these, I'd recommend killing the Bell Bearing Hunter at the Hermit Merchant's Shack here in Altus Plateau. Afterwards, you can hand in the Medicine Peddler's Bell Bearing at the Twin Maiden Husks to improve their inventory with boluses for sleep, but also frost, poison, and bleeding as well. As for offensive consumables, the freezing pot item is super underrated. It pretty much instantly inflicts frostbite on most bosses, which does a chunk of damage, it stuns the boss momentarily, and it also inflicts a debuff that increases the damage that enemy takes by 20% for a while. People have used this against Melania recently to great success. It breaks her out of her waterfowl dance, for example. To get the cookbook for these, turn right as soon as you enter Carrier Manor, and you'll find it in this small room. The rhymed crystal buds to make these freezing pots can be easily farmed here, west of the Ordina Town side of Grace in the Consecrated Snowfields. And of course, you'll also need a few ritual pots to craft these. Ritual pots are a resource that you get back after you throw a freezing pot and a couple can be easily found here in Jarburg, a hidden little town that's located off a drop from Leonia. I'll leave a link to all of the ritual pot locations in the description. The two mandatory bosses for entering the DLC are Moog and Radan. Let me give you some quick tips for them. For Radan, of course you know that running over these summon signs will summon help, but did you know that you can resummon those helpers as soon as they die? So, if you want a sure chance at winning this fight, play it slow and ride around the arena to resummon your companions if they die. One thing I like to do on low level characters is to use a stone sword key at round table hold and pick up Crepus's black key crossbow and the 20 black key bolts. These bolts can inflict rot on Radan, which synergizes extremely well with that passive summon playstyle we talked about. As for Moog, you'll be able to access him early as a part of the rune farming guide we mentioned earlier. But if you didn't do that, travel here in the consecrated snowfield and take the Waygate instead. And at the end of Mogwin Palace is this, Mikola's Cocoon. 
It's the entrance to the Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC, and of course, to access it, you'll need to defeat Moog. Two items exist in the game, specifically to make this fight easier. The first is Moog's Shackle, which can force him to the ground two times in Phase 1, making getting to Phase 2 a lot easier for you. To find this, you'll have to go to the subterranean shunning ground underneath Lane Dell. Start from the Avenue Balcony and make your way to Gransax's wing that is folded over a part of the city. Search underneath the wing and you'll eventually find a small well, which will eventually lead you to the underground and the underground roadside site of grace. From this grace, head to an entrance on the opposite wall and try to safely drop down from the pipes into the swamp below. The shackle is here. The second item you're going to want for this fight is the Purifying Crystal Tear, which you can put into your Flask of Wondrous Physic to drink and completely negate the effects of Moog's Nihil attack at the end of his countdown. This can be acquired by defeating Eleonora, who invades at the Second Church of Marica here in Altus Plateau. If she doesn't spawn here for you, you should try to complete Eura's questline by being invaded here in Limgrave then talking to Yura, and then after that you find a red summon sign at the main academy site of grace in Raya Lucaria. You help Yura defeat the assassin here, then talk to him afterwards nearby. Then Eleonora and Yura should appear at the second church of Marika, where you can get the tear. As for Moog's fight itself, ironically bleed weapons are quite good against Moog, and that's all I'll say about that. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. As always, I only take sponsorships for products that I actually use, so let me tell you why I think having a VPN is so great. Imagine you're traveling, for example. You're going to connect to public Wi-Fi at airports and hotels and cafes, right? So to prevent those places from spying on your activity or stealing personal information, you can use a VPN to mask your IP and encrypt your activity. And while you're traveling, have you ever noticed that you'll lose access to shows that you were streaming back when you were at home? That's because different regions offer different content on places like Netflix but with NordVPN, you can manually set your country of access and watch any show anywhere. And what if you're traveling to a country that has like a government restriction on the apps you can download or the websites you visit? NordVPN can easily make that a non-issue with the click of a button. Having NordVPN ready to go is unironically a great tool to have handy, and right now if you purchase a two-year NordVPN plan, then you'll receive an exclusive discount plus an additional four bonus months for free when you use my link nordvpn.com slash vartividia. That's nordvpn.com slash vartividia, or click the link in the description below. And if you're on the fence, don't worry too much, as Nord have this 30-day money-back guarantee, which is great. So give it a try. I have one final question for you guys. Do you think that any NPCs in the base game will show up in the Land of Shadow? If so, who? There are certainly a few characters I can think of with unresolved quest lines. First and foremost is Melina, whose true purpose is alluded to, but never revealed. Most players will burn her in the Giant's Flame Forge, so for the DLC, I wonder if it'll be better to keep the Erd Tree unburnt and keep Melina alive instead. Of course, this means you won't be able to get to Faramazula, so this isn't exactly optimal. Next is Millicent, who has a rebirth alluded to at the end of her questline if you side with Gowry and Millicent's sisters and kill her. You get a worse reward for doing this, so this is not optimal. But since the Land of Shadow DLC takes place in the present, I do wonder if we'll see some continuation of her questline. I'll be looking out for that, at least. I personally think that it's kind of unlikely that existing questlines will continue in the DLC, but it's possible, and at least with a fresh new character, there's a chance that you will be able to continue these questlines if you need to later. So, I hope this video helped, good luck preparing your characters, and thank you very much for watching.